We have another, we have not finished, we have another extraordinary person who are going to listen. Uh, it just, it's a, I will not call him a prophet this time, but like uh, Gunther, it's very difficult to introduce because this person of the future are in many different fields at the same time. They are, they are thinkers, they are doers, they are entrepreneurs. I will uh, call him in a, in a way as a voice of the voiceless, the people we usually don't um, cross the road, people we uh, even sometimes are more or less invisible for us. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see that these people really are able to do amazing things. And that's not only a lesson, that's not only a lesson uh, of say, okay, look at these people from development country, they are doing extraordinary things. No, the concept of frugal, innovation that Naviraju will develop is also essential for us in the developed world. He will uh, speak about the develop, pay under development, but in our country, countries, it's also very, very important for our future. It's why we are so glad now to hear uh, Naviraju. Thank you very much, Navi. Mm -hmm. No problem. Now take your time. Good morning, everyone. It's a delight to be here with you. Uh, I must say that uh, 36 hours ago, I was in uh, La Reunion, which is an island of Madagascar, at uh, zero meter uh, kind of uh, sea level. And it's kind of interesting to go from zero meter altitude to uh, almost 2,000 meters, so I'm still catching up my breath. So delighted to be here with you this morning to talk about a subject that I'm very passionate about, which is uh, fuel innovation. I just want you to kind of look at these two words next to each other. It's like an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, right? Something which is frugal, cheap, you might say, cannot be innovative. And similarly, when you look at the word innovation, you think about big R&D centers, billions of dollars in research and development, and therefore, innovation cannot be done frugally. And my job in the next you know, 45 minutes is to try to reconcile these, this contradiction between frugality and innovation. So let me begin by telling you about frugal innovation from a personal perspective and trace the kind of uh, humble origins of this very important concept. I grew up in Pondicherry, a uh, former French colony in southern uh, France. Um, the weather was very hot and water was rationed. So me and my brothers would wake up at five o'clock in the morning to fill these buckets with water that we had to clean ourselves and cook. And then once a week, we had the luxury of taking what we call a one bucket shower with one bucket. And also remember that even though I went to a French high school, next to my house was this old man who used to resell or rent actually old English magazines and books for just a few cents, which allowed me to catch up on English much faster than my fellow students. Of course, today in the West, we came up with a very fancy term for this called the circular economy, but we have been practicing it in poor countries for eons. So after experiencing scarcity for about 20 years, I emigrated to the West, probably lured by the promise of abundance. I studied for seven years in France, then went to United States and settled in Silicon Valley, where I live now for the past you know, 20 years now. And what I notice in the West is that innovation is considered as very sexy. Look at, for example, the MAVEN, the satellite launched by NASA, which entered Mars orbit in September 2015. It's an unbelievable kind of you know, scientific achievement. The problem is that this kind of innovation doesn't come cheap. Uh, this project actually cost $680 million of taxpayers' money, like myself, to send this baby into Mars. And that's what we have seen since World War II, is that companies in the West, whether they are American companies or European companies, have been outspending each other, outcompeting each other, to see who is going to be invest most in R&D. And now Asia, led by China, is entering the same R&D arms race, to the point where in 2016 it has been estimated that the biggest companies in the world spent a whopping $700 billion in R&D. What's wrong with this picture? Well, what's wrong is, just because you spend more in R&D doesn't mean you're systematically more innovative. And this was a very taboo subject that nobody talked about for a while, until 10 years ago, uh, several consultancies, including Strategy N, which is now part of PwC, begin to debunk this myth that more R&D leads to more innovation. 
As a matter of fact, they found that there's no correlation between how much you invest in R&D and how innovative you are. In other words, money does not buy innovation. And yet, we keep spending more and more in R&D to produce useless stuff like this one in Silicon Valley. It's a $400 Wi-Fi enabled juicer, which turns out to be no more effective than a manual juicer I use every morning, which only cost $1. Okay? This is the kind of useless innovation that led Sam Petroda, the former advisor to uh, the Prime Minister of India, to say that the world's best brains are wasting the brain power trying to solve rich people's problems who really don't have problems. Okay? But actually, what are the real problems? How about 17 of them? These are the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, established by United Nations to help the entire world community become better in terms of education, healthcare, access to energy, etc. So it became clear to us, me and my co-authors, that we have spent too much time in the West and we became so kind of enamored with abundance that we forgot our roots. So we decided to go back to roots which lie in scarcity to figure out how entrepreneurs in poor countries go about coming up with new products and services. In other words, how they go about innovating. What's the mindset? And that's where we discovered something amazing is that these entrepreneurs in emerging markets have a unique mindset. Let me illustrate the difference between what happens in Silicon Valley when an engineer comes to work Monday morning, he asks himself, what if he can create a solution that connects my fridge to my smartphone? We all have a fridge, we all have a smartphone, and if I run out of milk, I can get an SMS so I can fetch a gallon of milk on the way back home. That's what I call small what-if question. Because someone in India asks himself a big what-if question. What if I can invent a fridge that does not operate, that operate without electricity? That's a big what-if question because 600 million people in India live off the electricity grid. And this question wasn't asked by someone who has a PhD from uh, computer science from MIT or an MBA from Harvard, but by Mansur Prachapati, who didn't even finish his high school, is a porter by training who invented the world's greenest fridge called Mithikul, made entirely of clay. It's 100% biodegradable doesn't consume electricity, and essentially uses the principle of evaporation to keep the lower chambers cool. So it can keep fruits and vegetables fresh for several days, milk fresh for three days. So you can see that uh, the biggest lesson we learned studying these kind of, and I have several of them coming in future slides, is that these entrepreneurs are like alchemists. They're able to transmute adversity into opportunity, and particularly resource constraints are not a limitation for them, but actually are a spur for creativity and innovation. Like for example in Lima, the capital of Peru, this is a country that has 90% humidity rate and receives only one inch of rainfall every year. So a local engineering college developed this giant advertising billboard that absorbs the humidity in the air, condenses it, and generates 100 liters of drinkable water every day. So the Peruvians are amazing, they can literally create water out of thin air. And this kind of ability to do more with less, we also see in China, which is sitting on a ticking time bomb where half a billion people will be elderly citizens by 2050. And the government cannot build hospitals fast enough, train doctors fast enough to actually deal with the situation, which is an explosion of chronic diseases, particularly in rural areas of China. So Newsoft, which is a large IT service company, has developed this very interesting telemedicine solution, which actually consists in these very simple to use medical devices that can be operated by local technicians like nurses or local community workers who can collect the bio data, the vital signs from patients, elderly patients, and that goes into a cloud, and is algorithms analyze that and offers a preliminary diagnostic. And with Sirius, a doctor remotely from a city can actually offer a treatment plan. So this is a way essentially to scale out as opposed to scaling up a healthcare solution. And then of course, when I present these examples in the West, especially in America, we say, yeah, but you know, these solutions are fantastic, interesting, but you know, we in America, we put a man in the moon. Can you do that more with less? <laughs> well, actually it can be done because the same time that NASA's Maven entered Mars orbit, another spacecraft entered the orbit in Mars, it's Mangalian launched by India at a cost of $74 million, 10% of the cost of NASA, and developed three times faster. How? Because instead of building physical prototypes of the spacecraft, they actually did most of the simulation work, 
with software because India has an abundance of software talent. Okay? So interestingly, the movie Gravity with uh, Sandra Bullock and George Clooney cost $100 million to develop, produce. So while Hollywood explores uh, space in fiction, India can do that cheaper in reality. Okay? So that's the kind of the morale of the story. So when you look at all these amazing kind of, you know, ingenious, frugal solutions, we ask ourselves, like, you know, what is the kind of big idea behind all this thing? Is there a kind of methodology? Because, you know, we are academics and consultants. We are really eager to come up with the I'm a French as well. We call it like method, you know. We want to figure out what is the method, you know. Actually, sadly, there's no method. It's just a mindset that these entrepreneurs have. And I think Chido embo beautifully embodies that, which is the ability to use what is abundant to overcome what is scarce. It sounds simple, but it's very profound. As a matter of fact, I use the empty glass water because I'm French, and the national sport in France is not football, is rally, which is to complain. They always look at the glass as being half empty. But interestingly, in emerging markets, they acknowledge that, yes, half the glass is empty because they don't have certain resources like, you know, water, energy, or money, but they celebrate the abundance of intangible resources they have human qualities like empathy, ingenuity, resilience, or the kind of traditional knowledge they may have, or the social capital as well they have. And they use what is abundant, these intangible resources, to overcome what they don't have, the scarce resources. And this logic can extend to something more important because I live in Silicon Valley, where we keep chasing the next big thing. But what if you use the last big thing to create new value? In other words, what if you use existing technologies to come up with better solutions. And I think there is a continent that is teaching us a lot about how to do that, is Africa. And I'm delighted we have two speakers from Africa today, because this is a continent of extremes. On the one hand, 80% of you know, African nations don't have a bank account or access to reliable electricity. But 80% Africans have a mobile phone. So they're using the abundance of mobile connectivity to overcome the scarcity of basic services, like in the case of M-Pesa, as you know, in Kenya, which allows half the population to send, receive money using the mobile phone without having a bank account, without having a bank account. And today, half the country's GDP is transacted to the system. And as a matter of fact, what's amazing is that, uh, you know, I, growing up in a former, you know, Western colony, is that now the world is reversing itself in the logic of innovation because solutions first tested out in poor countries are now being deployed in mature economies because Orange, the operator, telecom operator, has a rival solution called Orange Money, which was tested also in Africa, and they got last year a license to become a bank. So in 2018, Orange will be deploying the same solution in France and other European countries. So Orange will become a bank from next year, using a solution, frugal solution, that is pioneered in the South. So, of course, Kelvin will come later. I can wait to hear from him as well because he also embodies this frugal, resilient ingenuity of Africa. So what I want to do now is, you know, again, being French, I can't, you know, help myself introducing the method, right, behind this kind of, you know, uh, creativity that I described so far. And that method is called frugal innovation. Because in the West, if you don't have an English term, nothing is taken seriously. So we ended up calling it frugal innovation. So I want to talk about what is the philosophy of frugal innovation, but also the core principles. So in a nutshell, frugal innovation is about trying to create more, not just value, but also values, while at the same time trying to minimize use of resources. It sounds rather simple until we go into more details. So let's kind of deconstruct these two elements. The denominator, values, because it's not just about creating more economic value, it's about economic and social, and as Gunther said, positive ecological value. So it's not enough to reduce the carbon footprint, you have to enlarge your ecological handprint. Okay? So that's about also about the values, because it has a moral dimension, we'll talk about that as well. And in terms of resources, it's about, of course, you know, reducing capital, energy, and time. So you look at this and say, now we wait a second, you know, well, the corporate world, and we have been doing it for eons, you know, what the heck is new in this one? Well, it's new and, let's say, another Western term, disruptive, when you start putting a little order of magnitude. What if you start creating a solution that delivers 10 times more value using 10 times fewer resources? Now we are talking with, for example, this medical device, an ECG device developed by G Healthcare, 
which cost one tenth of the cost of Western ECG devices. It's also one tenth lighter. That means that a doctor can carry it in his bicycle in India and go consult patients in remote villages. And that's important. If the patient cannot come to the doctor or the machine, the machine has to go to the doctor. So you have to redesign the product so that it's more accessible. So also it is actually more energy efficient because the battery lasts much longer. So this is a solution that delivers 10, 10x more value using 10x fewer resources. Now, let's push the envelope a bit. What if a solution delivers 100x more value with 100x fewer resources? Now it becomes truly disruptive. And there is such a solution actually I brought with me. It's actually called Embrace. And I think with the mic, it's going to be difficult to uh, do a quick demonstration, but I will tell you what it is about. No, no, it's, it's all right. I, can, I can try this. So essentially, it's uh, the fact that there are millions of babies that are born prematurely around the world. And when they are born, uh, we in the West, we put them in an incubator that costs $20,000 and require electricity to operate, which, of course, is expensive and uh, you know, uh, unaffordable in poor countries. So four students from Stanford, including Jane Shen, whom you see here, designed this uh, interesting solution, which is essentially looks like a mini sleeping bag. It's actually a portable infant warmer. So essentially inside, it has this uh, material called a phase change material. It's like wax. And you can place it on a heating pad or put it in a boiling water. It melts. And you reinsert it. And you can actually keep um, the baby at constant temperature for six hours straight. And this solution costs only $200 and doesn't need any electricity. But what's important, uh, it actually doesn't save babies' lives. It also touches them emotionally because it allows for what we call the kangaroo care. The mother can actually hold the baby close to her. And that's why in Stanford now and other Western hospitals, they're using this now as a complement to traditional incubators so the mother can hold the baby from time to time. Okay? And uh, of course, she's a you know, very famous Jane Chan, and uh, she met with Obama, and Beyonce is a champion, which doesn't hurt, hurt either. Uh, and more importantly, they have saved the lives of 300,000 babies in the last six years. And the goal is to save the lives of one million babies in the next five years. Okay? Now, let's push it even further. What will happen, by the way, so this is important, right? It's not about just creating more value. It's sometimes it's about saving more lives. And that's why I think that this kind of innovation is very noble in nature. Now, let's push it even further. What about not just saving lives, but pe making people even more alive by a factor of 1,000? And at the same time, do so in a way that is 1,000x cheaper and better. So that is what is my next example, which is the fact that there are, I guess, millions of, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of kids around the world who live without the hands. Either they lost them in accident or due to congenital uh, diseases. And if they want to be equipped with a uh, kind of a high-end and industrial prosthesis, it cost $35,000. But an NGO called Enable the Future uses 3D printers to allow parents to print themselves this prosthesis and assemble it and put it on the kids, and that solution cost only $35. Okay? And such a solution brought immense joy to Maxence, a young kid in France who became France's first kid to be equipped with a 3D printed hand, or this young Indonesian woman, woman who was able to feed a newborn baby for the first time with her own hands. So for me, in a nutshell, if you ask me what is for innovation, it's a wise innovation that tries to maximize joy while minimizing suffering of human beings. So, so far what it is, you know, kind of... Uh, start with the genesis of this concept of frugal innovation, that which comes actually for poor, poor, poor countries. I offered you know, an outline of what is the theory and why it's disruptive. And now I want to show that it's an universal in nature, in the sense that it's not limited to the, West, the, the poor countries, but actually even the rich countries, the need for doing more with less is emerging as a result, frugal innovation is being adopted in rich countries as well. So let me explain why this is happening. To begin with is the fact that there's a fundamental shift, I would say, in the values, needs, and expectations of consumers in the Western world. They're becoming what I call values conscious. As you can see, since 2008, more and more consumers prefer to buy private label brands. They're not attached, especially the millennials, young kids, 
are not attached to labels and brands like we were, Generation X. And also, there is this growing movement we call Sobriété Heureuse in France, uh, Simplicité Volontaire, we call it also, and Americans also always have to come up with a new term. Uh, they call them minimalism. Of course, we elect a U.S. president who embodies maximalism, but it turns out that, you know, uh, you know, a lot of Americans now embracing this concept called minimalism, which essentially consists in downshifting. That is, even though you have money, you choose to live a simpler life. So this is actually uh, two uh, young people who actually have been uh, becoming like rock stars in America. They are Josh and uh, Ryan, 30-somethings, who left a comfy job and a big house, big car, to go live in misery, a very simple life. And they have written uh, actually a lot of books and done a documentary you can watch on Netflix. And they have already reached about 20 million Americans now who follow them. Okay? So this is an amazing growing movement. The ability to live better with less, which is you know, unheard of in America, but this is happening. Uh, we also noticed that more and more uh, consumers in the West are becoming eco-conscious. They demand that brands become, uh, behave in a more uh, socially, ecological, responsible way. And also you can see that 80% consumers now, especially in France, prefer to buy products locally, and this is what we call circuit court. Uh, and actually, I'm also a big fan of that. I live in California, and uh, California, and uh, I decided to buy only products grown within a 900-mile radius. It's big California. So as uh, somebody who grew up in India, I gave up uh, banana, mango, uh, you know, all kind of tropical fruits, papaya, I don't eat them, uh, which is, you know, sad, but, you know, I have to live up to my values. So... I think this is a kind of movement, I think you will see more and more citizens practice, you know, to actually source products that are locally grown, you know, within their, you know, region. But what's more alarming is the fact that actually more and more young people, the millennials actually, value quality over quantity. Uh, you can see that many of them prefer to have access to a car on demand as opposed to owning a car. Uh, my generation uh, felt that a car was a status symbol, not for them. It's just something utilitarian. But more interestingly, if you are an employer, you can see that 66% young people want to be an entrepreneur. They want to be their own boss and not have a boss you know, above them. So that's very important because this transitions to, um, I think, the most important slide in my discussion, which is that what is really happening, I think, is that citizens, I would say, around the world are becoming more conscious. Now, the term conscious in the Western world, in medical terms, means that you're awake as opposed to being asleep or in a coma. But in Eastern tradition, consciousness has a whole different meaning. And where I come from, India, we have actually an approach to describe the different levels of consciousness, which is based on what we call the chakras, which are essentially the energy centers located in our subtle body. There are seven of them. I will start with the three basic chakras, which actually control or influence, or I call it the animal instincts, which are the fear, survival, Desire, first it's for sex, then it's about I need a bigger car, I need a bigger title, I need a bigger residence. And then once you have bigger, bigger, it's not enough. You want, it, you want to have it all. That's control and domination. That's the third chakra. As long as you live a life that is completely dominated by the energies of these lower chakras, you live a life of, of having. Because you will never be satisfied. You always want to have more. And you're always self-centered. It's all about me, 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 me. And you always experience a sense of scarcity. There's a sense of lack. Something is missing, and it's never going to be fulfilled or filled. The transition to consciousness really happens is when you activate the heart chakra. Because the heart chakra is a seat of compassion, which is nothing other than the passion to alleviate the suffering of others. And then you activate the throat chakra, Vishuddhi, which is about authenticity and ingenuity. We all are born with the song that we are uniquely destined to sing. The problem is that most of us die without ever discovering it. And that is the seat of authentic ingenuity. And then comes the third eye, the Arjuna. I'm sorry, the third eye, which is the Arjuna. And that's where you discover the wisdom. You realize that actually we are all connected. You begin to appreciate and celebrate diversity. And then comes the seventh chakra, which is about unity with the supreme consciousness. And as you transition from lower chakras to upper chakras, you start transitioning to a life of being. Your mode of existence is no longer having. It's about being because you experience a sense of abundance. You are rich inside. And because you're rich inside, 
you can willingly share more things with others without feeling impoverished. And more importantly, you go from self-centered to other-centered. You care more for others than for yourself. So with this as a kind of a framework for the evolution of consciousness, I want to show how this new consciousness is actually going to be uh, shaping a new economy uh, that is powered by human energy that I call the frugal economy that actually rests on three pillars, which is sharing, making, and uh, reusing. And I'm going to slightly pick up space because I'm getting a bit nervous for the time. So, and also being Indian, this is you know a problem we have. You know, we have a machine gun delivery style. So uh, I'm going to try to leverage what I have to kind of you know be, uh, you know meet the time constraint. So some of this thing you're already aware. Of course, you know the sharing economy. Everybody knows uh, this is about sharing cars and apartments. It's estimated that the B2C sharing among consumers is going to be about 335 billion dollars, uh, as big as a rental business by 2025. And of course, uh, there are some interesting examples like Blah Blah Car, a, a car sharing service, ride sharing actually platform uh, that has now almost over 25 million members uh, growing by leaps and bounds. Within two years in India, by the way, they become number one platform. Unbelievable, within two years. Okay? It's exploding everywhere. But I would argue that that's just you know, a, drip, a drop, droplet in ocean. The real exciting thing is what will happen if uh, businesses start sharing resources. That's what I call B2B sharing. This is very early stage, but I want to give you some exa one example which is inspiring, which I think uh, builds on Gunter's point as well, uh, which is the idea that what happens if you look, use what is abundant and share it with others. Uh, this is almost like operating from upper chakra of sharing, and this is in Denmark in the Kalenberg Eco-Industrial Park, where about 10 companies co-located it's called industrial symbiosis. That means that your waste becomes my raw material. So everything is shared in a closed loop fashion. Okay? And I think that this is the first step. After waste, there could be factory capacity. Uh, it could be you know, human resources as well and potentially intellectual property as well. So B2B sharing, I think, is going to be the future and a very exciting way to build a frugal economy. And then comes the second exciting pillar, which is the maker movement. You heard about the 3D printers, which allows Mr. You know, Madam Everybody to actually build their own product. But that's not as exciting as what's coming next, which I want to talk about, which is essentially that there is a democratization of innovation. That means that the building blocks, such as electronic components that used to be very expensive, are becoming very, very cheap. So as a matter of fact, I have brought with me one of them uh, here. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is called a Raspberry Pi. It's actually a computer the size of a credit card that costs only $35. Uh, it's open source, so anybody can actually access the code and improve it. Developed at Cambridge University. Initially designed to teach our kids, especially girls, how to program. And the next thing they know, uh, I checked this morning because the numbers keep growing, they have sold over 23 million units. Why? Because this can be used to build all kind of amazing solutions, like you see on the right-hand side in the slide, that's literally a school in a box. So because you can take all, okay, let me step back. The five mil, a billion people in the world who don't have internet access. So they can access things like Wikipedia or the Khan Academy, which offers, as you know, online tutorials for math, science, engineering. So this actually, what it does is it takes all that content, it has a lot of memory inside, you download it, and then you have a Wi-Fi inside. So you Wi-Fi enable it, it becomes a local server. So you can put it here in a classroom, and the kids can access it using the tablets. In India, they have developed a tablet for the cost of only $35 instead of the 600 bucks for the Apple iPad. Okay? So the kids, in two hours, no, notice that there are, there's no uh, teacher in the school. They can actually, in two hours, self-assemble the classroom themselves and start learning. And the whole solution costs only 150 bucks. Okay? So that's the first step, right? The democratization of innovation with what we call open source hardware. Then comes this more exciting, more revolutionary thing, which is going to be called frugal science. So this is, I'm pushing the kind of the boundary. If you think about the, the innovation, right? There is science, technology, and then application. So I talked about application, I talked about technology, I'm pushing all the way up in the, in the value chain. What if science, scientific discoveries can be done frugally now? So this is being pioneered by Manu Pragash, who is a professor at Stanford University. And he's actually launching this field called frugal science by developing, for example, a 50-cent uh, microscope, which can be folded like paper origami. 
and it can actually increase uh, subcellular structures like parasites, microbes, by a factor of 2,000, which allows you essentially to detect you know, diseases or also conduct scientific experiments. And this is being deployed at this, they've been deploying about 1 million units worldwide, and it reaches you know, amazing places like this Maasai you know, tribal school in Kenya. Okay? And he's not stopping there. Uh, he's now uh, coming up with another interesting product, which is a 20 cent centrifuge that separates you know, blood plasma from red cells in 90 seconds without using electricity. So this is the field of frugal science, which is going to democratize you know, scientific you know, discoveries. Of course, uh, the next trend in the maker movement is that if everybody starts making, wait a second, in the old times, they used to say, I consume, therefore I am. So I used to drive miles to go to a supermarket, buy stuff, and mindlessly consume. But now you are saying that I create, therefore I am. So then that means that the last mile, that we call it the, you know, the point of you know, sale, is going to become the first mile of what I call co-creation. That means that instead of passively consuming, you go there to create something and not buy something. And this is happening with Leroy Merlin, which is a home improvement retailer in France, which is converting some of the stores into a makerspace. So you go there, there are 3D printers, laser cutters, etc., and you can make your own piece of furniture instead of buying it at Ikea. And it doesn't stop there. You can also take, let's say your washing machine breaks down, you can take the defective part, go there, 3D print a replacement part, and extend the life cycle of your machine. Okay? This allows you to combat what we call planned obsolescence. Okay? Now, the third pillar, I don't have to introduce that, many of you know, it's the circle economy. The idea that we are moving from a linear economy where we you know, extract raw materials from Earth, make an iPhone, use it for a couple of years, and then we get rid of it, it goes into landfill. Now it's possible to design products in a way that you, know, you can reuse them again and again in the sense that you can take the raw materials inside and make you know, new products. Now, this has been talked about so far and you know, 4.5 trillion economic opportunity is gonna be available around this thing. But what's interesting is that lately I've been thinking, wait a second, this is interesting, but what if this concept applies not just to physical resources, again, tangible resources, but to intangible resources. In other words, what will happen if you start practicing upcycling of knowledge? Because knowledge also is a resource. So instead of creating ever new, more new knowledge, what if you reuse old knowledge to create new value? And it's coincidentally, a few weeks ago, the European Commission published a landmark seminal report on frugal innovation and checked the subtitle of the report. It's called Reengineering of Traditional Techniques. So what they are saying is that, wait a second, innovation is not just about coming up with new intellectual property, it's actually also about using existing technologies to create new applications. How do we do that? So here's an example. Uh, it is actually from uh, Lafarge, the cement maker, which as you know, merged with Hall Sim. And they are doing something interesting in India. Instead of getting all the village people to move in cities and live in these ugly you know, apartment complexes, they're actually using the traditional knowledge of building huts using mud, except that they use the power of science to create a binder that you mix with the mud when you build these huts. So it allows the mud, hut, hut actually to be more resistant to the monsoon rains and is a repellent to mosquitoes and rats. So you preserve the tradition, but you modernize it. Okay? This is what I call the circular knowledge economy. This is going to be, for me, the next wave after this traditional circular economy. So, in summary, I would say, uh, so far we have defined progress in a very unidimensional way, measuring GDP as an indicator. We all know that that indicator is causing a lot of trouble for us because just going for more growth, economic growth, is actually leaving a lot of people excluded and uh, depleting natural resources. So clearly, growth purely through the lens of economic you know, kind of expansion is not the right way to go. I propose that instead of growth, we talk about development, and particularly human development, using this you know, framework of evolution of consciousness, which I think is important, starting with kids. Uh, and I believe we can actually build a frugal economy, which is powered by human energy. And uh, this is a shameless plug for my next book called Conscious Society. And I think it is possible also that we can all co-create a conscious society where we can all live better with less. And of course, uh, I must uh, you know, thank uh, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, we had you know, a dinner yesterday together. 
And uh, I added a slide a couple of weeks ago, and then I took it away. I thought, you know, well, this audience is going to be more business kind of audience. You know, I don't want to have a slide uh, you know, or something from the art, art world. But I think after, you know, discussing with her, you know, I was very inspired. So yesterday night, 11 p.m., I wanted to add one slide from the artistic world to really illustrate how artists teach us how to be frugal and more importantly, that less can be more and better. So let's watch a little video. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much.